I'm Natalie Fox and I'm a registered dietitian. And in this video, we're going to talk all about probiotic supplements. What are they? Do they even work? And whether or not you should bother spending money on them. So let's jump right in. To start off with, what are probiotic supplements? In the absolute simplest terms, probiotics are basically small doses of the types of bacteria that are typically found in your gut. Generally speaking, certain strains of bacteria have been associated with health benefits, whereas other strains have been associated with certain health risks. And recent research has suggested that when this balance between beneficial and potentially harmful bacteria gets shifted, people can start experiencing certain health challenges and digestive issues. And so the idea is that if you take these beneficial bacterial strains as a supplement, that it's going to promote a more beneficial balance of bacteria in your gut. One issue with this idea though is that the bacteria that you take as a supplement may not actually hang around to substantially change the composition of your gut microbiome. And part of the reason for this is because of something called colonization resistance. And what that is is essentially that the new strains of bacteria that you're trying to introduce through a supplement can't compete with the strains already present in your digestive tract. The other reason for this is that bacterial strains can only survive in your gut if they have access to a consistent fuel source. And so if you are not eating the foods that these bacterial strains like to eat in your diet, chances are they're probably not going to hang around. In fact, changing your diet can actually impact the composition of your gut microbiome in as little as 24 hours. To overcome this, many supplement companies are including something called prebiotics in their formulation. And prebiotics are essentially a specialized fiber supplement as fiber is the primary fuel source for these bacterial strains. The idea here is that if you take a probiotic strain and its fuel source at the same time, then that strain is more likely to actually take root in your gut. However, the studies I was able to find that shows that this is actually an effective strategy have largely been done in an animal model or in a petri dish rather than being done in humans. And so it is a little hard to say whether or not this is actually effective in real practice. I would also be remiss if I didn't mention that the best sources of fiber, if you are looking to either improve or support a healthy and diverse gut microbiome, are fiber rich plant foods rather than supplements. And that is because plant foods contain a much wider variety of types of fiber or fuel sources than a supplement would. So overall, I would say that the hypothesis that taking probiotic supplements and hopefully taking something that is going to be a fuel source for those strains is pretty promising and sounds good, but does the research actually support these probiotic companies' health claims? To explore this, I wanna look at seed probiotics because this company does appear to be more evidence-based and legitimate than other brands. They do test their product for purity and quality and provide the results of that testing on their website. They have verified that their supplements will likely survive the acidic environment in the stomach using Shime, which is a model for human digestion that is well-established and frequently used in research. They have verified that the packaging does protect the bacterial strains from heat degradation so that this supplement doesn't need to be refrigerated. And they also have a battery of PhDs and MDs on their scientific advisory board. Additionally, their product is currently being investigated in two clinical trials. All of these factors make this product a lot more legitimate than other supplements. But let's take a closer look at their health claims and the research they are using to back that up. Now, the first thing that I want to really underline here is that the intended user of this supplement is everybody. It's a general audience. This supplement is not intended for a specific population who has specific issues. And they claim that everyone is going to see a benefit from taking their product. And the argument for why you should take their supplement is essentially, well, there are microbes in your gut, they do good things, so having more of those microbes is a good idea. If this were true and everybody who takes this supplement can expect to see better digestion, better cardiovascular health, better skin health, etc., the studies that I would need to see in order for those health claims to be evidence-based would have to be studies where these strains are given to a healthy human population and that healthy human population saw those benefits. Otherwise, they can't make the claim that their product does any of this, right? So to put this in a different context, Tylenol is very effective at lowering fevers and improving certain types of pain. If you do not have one of those challenges, there is no benefit to taking Tylenol. And so the producers of Tylenol should not be making the claim that taking Tylenol daily supports fever-free and pain-free living for everybody, because there's just no evidence to support that benefit for that population. On their website, they have a pretty big list of studies that support the efficacy for the strains that they are including in their product. Now, this is a pretty big list, and I'm not going to go through and rip apart 32 studies because I would bore myself with that. So let's do a little housekeeping and cut this list down. Let's start with crossing out all of the studies that are listed multiple times on this list. Okay, so that eliminated 10 of them. That's a pretty good start. Next, let's get rid of any in vitro or animal studies. Would you look at that? That got rid of 13 more. Now, the reason why I am discounting animal or in vitro studies is not because that is not valid research. In vitro or petri dish studies and research done in animal models is all very important research. 
However, these studies are important for the body of research as a whole. They help us figure out why things work the way they do, and they help to inform future research. But the human body, and human digestion in particular, is a lot more complex than what you are able to see when you're seeing interactions in a petri dish. For example, a couple of these studies are looking at the interactions between these bacterial strains and human blood samples. But that is such a different context from taking a probiotic supplement orally, having it travel all the way through your digestive tract, and also encountering and interacting with the other bacterial strains that are present in your intestine. And so the results of these in vitro studies are likely going to be different than the effect that you can expect to have in a human model. And when it comes to animal studies, well, we're not rats. And not all of the results that we see in an animal model hold true when we test that exact same hypothesis in humans. And so you really, really, really cannot use this kind of research as evidence for the efficacy of a product intended for general use. All right, back to our list. So just because I'm feeling a little bit petty, I wanna point out that two of the studies on this list are actually incorrect. The study linked here with the hyperlink is actually a different study than the one they were citing. And this study appears to be an irrelevant study that was done by the same authors. Likely they intended to cite a study by the same research group that was done in 2011. Okay, so we're down to nine papers now. So as I mentioned before, these probiotics are supposed to be beneficial for a general audience. So let's go through and eliminate any research that was done that shows efficacy for special populations. Oh my, it seems we only have just one study left. So this study is being used to justify their claim that their product supports micronutrient synthesis. And this study does indeed show that this probiotic strain when administered does result in an increased amount of folate showing up in the fecal samples of their study participants. However, that doesn't actually mean that taking the supplement is going to be beneficial for somebody for two reasons. The first is that this study doesn't actually show that taking this probiotic supplement improves folate stores it is quite possible that this bacterial strain produces folate lower down in the GI tract than where the majority of folate absorption takes place. B12 is a really great example of this happening. Certain bacteria in our gut can produce B12. However, we are not able to absorb enough of it in the part of the GI tract where this takes place in order to prevent a deficiency if somebody does not have a dietary source of B12. And it's funny that I should mention that because supporting B12 synthesis is another health claim that Seed makes about their product. The second reason, and probably the most important reason why somebody might not get a benefit from taking the strain is that folate deficiency is really rare. So if you are getting enough folate in your diet, which most people do, you're not necessarily going to see any benefit from having more of it synthesized in your gut, even if it is accessible to you. Okay, so we can safely say that seed probiotics has not presented any evidence that supports the idea that healthy people with no health concerns are going to benefit from taking their supplement. So if that's you, don't waste your money. If you are interested in probiotics because you wanna support a healthy and beneficial gut microbiome as a preventative measure, the best and most effective things that you can do are to one, eat enough fiber, ideally from a wide variety of plant foods. Number two, don't drink. Number three, don't smoke. And number four, don't take antibiotics unless it's absolutely needed. Now, what if you do have health complaints? Would this probiotic help? To answer that question, let's walk through the two health claims that actually have some human studies to back it up. The first group of claims centers around cardiovascular health. Seed Probiotics claims that their supplement promotes heart health, maintains cholesterol levels that are already in the normal range, and supports the intestinal recycling of cholesterol and bile. First of all, there is absolutely no way to know whether or not their product is working if the primary benefit is the continued maintenance of normal function. And I think they know that because like most grifters, they ask their customers to take their claims on faith. In this section of the FAQ, they say that it is totally normal to not notice any difference, but you know, psh, don't worry, it's working, we promise. Second of all, all fiber that you eat from pretty much any source is going to support the intestinal recycling of cholesterol and bile. So right on its face before going into any of the studies, these claims are really wishy-washy. But let's look at the studies. So this first study does show some pretty impressive results in terms of improvements in lipid profile for people taking these specific bacterial strains. However, this study was published in PLOS One, which always makes me raise an eyebrow. So PLOS One is an open source journal that researchers pay in order to get their publications into. Now, not everything that is published in PLOS One is a load of garbage. However, if your paper had results that were really exciting or robust, you'd probably get your paper into a better journal. And the peer review process at PLOS One is a little bit dubious. When I was in graduate school, my advisor used to be a reviewer for PLOS One and she stopped doing it because she noticed that a lot of the papers that she failed review for actually were going on to get published unedited. 
And what she found out was that when she failed a paper, they would just send that paper on to more and more reviewers until they found enough to pass the paper. And that makes sense if they're getting paid for every single paper that get published. There's no incentive for a paper to fail review. And so whenever I see anybody citing a paper published in PLOS One, I always want to look at that method section. So it is really evident in this paper that what happened is that this study was a flop, but they are trying really hard to salvage something interesting out of it in order to get it published. And you can tell that this is happening because they keep having to split the participants off into smaller and smaller subgroups in order to see any relationship between taking the supplement and seeing an improvement in lipids. So they're having to break participants up and stratify results based on starting cholesterol value, age, time point in the study. So they're not seeing a result over the entire intervention period, just at specific time points. And that is how they're reporting their results. And the conclusion of the study is essentially, well, maybe we would have seen something if the study was better. And so really this study proves nothing. But supplement companies use research like this because they know that consumers are not going to read the study. And if they do read the study, the likelihood that they're going to tell that the study is a giant turd is pretty low. They're just going to be impressed that there's a citation at all. Now, the second study does have some interesting results in terms of people who have very high cholesterol seeing a slight improvement when they're taking a probiotic. However, the sample size is really, really small. And so it's not a robust enough study to say that most people who are going to take this are going to see any sort of effect on their cholesterol. Moving on to digestive health. So they see that their probiotic improves bloating and overall improves the whole bowel movement experience. They cite two studies in humans that are both looking at the effect of taking these strains on people who have chronic constipation. Both these studies were relatively small, but they did see a benefit with people on average having about one more bowel movement a week than they were having before. So not a drastic difference, not a cure for constipation by any means. However, if you're someone who's been struggling with constipation, one more bowel movement in a week may actually really improve your quality of life. Now here is a review paper that they didn't cite that summarizes the results of a number of meta-analysis on this particular topic. And the conclusion that this paper comes to mirrors what these studies found, and that is that on average, taking certain probiotic strains may improve stool frequency for people with constipation by, on average, give or take roughly about one bowel movement a week. However, this paper also notes some serious limitations with a lot of the studies used in the meta-analysis, namely that the supplements that were being administered in several of the studies included other components that are known to improve constipation, such as psyllium. There's also a lot of variability between studies in terms of the strains that were used, how long the intervention trial was for, and the sample sizes. All that to say that the results of the study are not super robust. So if you are somebody who struggles with constipation and the idea of having one more bowel movement a week sounds really good to you, taking a probiotic might not be a bad idea because in general there's not a lot of negative side effects from taking them. However, there's a couple of things I want to note. The first is that most of this research is strain specific. So it's specific strains of probiotics having a specific improvement effect. And so just taking any probiotic that you find off the shelf may not actually help. The second thing is a friendly reminder that the supplement industry is unregulated. So if you are looking to buy a probiotic, I would encourage you to find one that is third party tested and also list the results of that third party testing on their website. Now, another digestive issue that often sends people seeking probiotics is IBS. As I mentioned at the top, Seed Probiotics is currently conducting a clinical trial to see whether or not their probiotic is helpful for IBS symptoms. But aside from that, there already are several studies that show that people suffering from IBS do experience symptom improvement when taking certain strains of probiotics. However, there is low certainty in those results for a couple of reasons. Most meta-analysis and review papers say that there is a very high risk of bias in this research. And a big part of that is because a lot of the research being done is being funded at part or entirely by supplement companies. And a probiotic company wouldn't publish a paper that showed that their product was ineffective. Seed is also conducting a clinical trial to see whether or not their product is effective for post-antibiotic diarrhea. Now, this review paper shows that there actually are several strains that have been shown to be at least somewhat effective for post-antibiotic diarrhea. However, this body of research has the same methodological issues that we see with the research being done on IBS. And that is that there is a high likelihood of bias, and also there's a lot of variability between studies in terms of the methods used, which makes it really hard to pull results from multiple studies to draw a conclusion. Now, I don't want you to interpret this breakdown as me saying that probiotics are ineffective. If you have taken probiotics and you have seen a benefit from them, that is awesome. Anything that improves your quality of life is a win. And there is certainly evidence to suggest that it is possible that probiotics can be beneficial for certain people. However, while the research being done on probiotics and the gut microbiome is exciting and promising, 
it's just not there yet to make an evidence-based recommendation for most individuals. And there certainly isn't any evidence to support people taking probiotics willy-nilly as part of a wellness regimen when they don't have a specific issue that might actually benefit from it. And I think this is the huge issue with the wellness and biohacking industries. Influencers and companies like this take really cool, innovative, and exciting research, and they take the results from it and run way into left field to pitch it like it's some magic pill that's going to fix all of your problems. Don't fall for it. A year's supply of seed probiotics costs about $600 a year. So save your money and spend it on something that's actually going to bring you joy because in all likelihood that is going to do a lot more for your quality of life and your long-term health than an expensive probiotic. Well, that's all that I've got for you today. Let me know in the comment section below if there are any other diet supplements or topics that you would like to see me break down in the future and I will see you in the next video.